introduce our next speaker, our, our own uh, Walter Yetz, who's uh, an associate professor over here in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. Um, also has uh, close ties uh, around this school as well. And um, Walter is going to be speaking on uh, the Map of Life project. Great. Thanks a lot, Dave. And thanks, everybody, for coming. And thanks to the speakers earlier this afternoon and uh, John for really a brilliant overview. Uh, and uh, and uh, with those questions we had actually uh, just a, a minute ago, we actually have a nice segue into what I'm trying to talk about here. Um, I'll be uh, jumping straight into a specific project that's certainly not small in scope, but it's uh, narrower than some of what we've heard this afternoon. I think it's become clear really neatly from uh, Jonathan Hextra's talk that um, there is a need for a detailed uh, spatial biodiversity and knowledge. You remember those maps and the question we just had earlier? Those were very broad blobs in the world. And actually, all of these different organizations were trying to get at a different aspect of biodiversity, but all of them had incomplete knowledge. So they were saying, well, roughly here are endemic or threatened species of this or that, or here are roughly uh, endangered ecosystems. But ultimately, what they really all wanted or would have liked to have is actually um, detailed biodiversity data that they would then, of course, link to other socioeconomic variables that uh, they were interested in as an organization. But uh, it's mostly that lack of that sort of data that has caused these um, regions, including the ecoregions, which have been uh, really important uh, in, in conservation prioritization, at least at the very broad scale, and, and, and helping take the next steps. Um, it's the, the lack of knowledge that has held us back in, in many ways. The other uh, point, just connecting to previous speakers, is that uh, we do need uh, the global perspective here. It became clear from the eBird analysis, even fo focused on the US. Uh, we saw that birds are moving in and out of the US every year. Um, and we saw from the Encyclopedia of Life that from an educational perspective um, and from some of the mammal prioritization analyses, conservation prioritization analyses that Harald Sibais showed us, or Ben Collins' work, that we need to take a global perspective if we want to do successful conservation prioritization and indeed uh, successfully want to answer some of the still important uh, and remaining questions uh, that are basic uh, in biodiversity uh, science. Now, what I'm going to talk about is a project, an initiative that's very young. It's only a year and a half, two years old. So um, we are um, by far not as advanced uh, and, and stunning and important uh, recognized as the Encyclopedia of Life is or several of the other projects we've heard about uh, today. Um, but uh, we are trying to sort of focus on one specific aspect and try come in from a scientist's perspective and try and get that right and bring the right people together, both from the NGO, GEO, as well as the science world to get that done. And uh, just trying to tell you a little bit about that, I'm not going so much into my own research, but into explaining to you that larger web-based infrastructure, that dynamic infrastructure that uh, uh, Jonathan was, was sort of alluding to, that the importance of being dynamic um, and being able to respond quickly as new data comes in and as environment changes, that sort of infrastructure uh, we're trying to um, put together with the map of life. Let me start out with uh, this image here. It's uh, uh, based on uh, NASA satellites. It's a global land cover classification down uh, at a resolution of 500 meters. So we have a reasonably good understanding of uh, the global land cover. Thanks to other remote sensing products, we have an understanding of the global uh, topography at about 90 meters or even 30 meters. So incredibly detailed uh, data at the global scale, all the way from the tropics to the high latitudes. Um, data that's um, very, very scientifically accurate and usable and uh, um, that's coming about, has been coming about over the last uh, 10 years or so. Here, uh, as uh, Steve mentioned, important temporal dimension. We have also an incredibly detailed temporal picture here of how land cover or here the greenness of vegetation changes uh, week by week. Uh, every day we're getting this data in. So, and it's an incredible amount of data. It's, this is big data that's coming in on a daily basis that actually uh, provides extremely detailed information about this planet. Now, putting this together, 
this makes us realize that as far as environment is concerned, climate, topography, we are uh, now at a point where we have an extremely detailed understanding of our planet um, at a scale or a grain size, a pixel size of down to, as I said, um, 90 meters with regards to topography globally. Uh, with, as far as climate is concerned, um, can extract temperature and rainfall information out of many of these satellite products down to a kilometer, 500 meters. Uh, land cover, 500 meters. Even projected land cover, some of those models sort of taking climate change projections and then connecting them with, with vegetation, projecting into the future, even those models are getting down to a, a 50 kilometer uh, detail. Now, and of course, no need to mention our understanding of where humans are and what they do um, is also spatially very detailed. And you saw some of those maps earlier um, by, by, by John. So what's really the question then is, where are we with our species distribution data, with our biodiversity knowledge? Clearly, uh, we, we seem not to be at this fine grain, otherwise we wouldn't have such blobby maps of the world, sort of where are important areas for conservation. So what is our global biodiversity knowledge? Well, there is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, a really important uh, global organization that's pulling together uh, point data mostly from all sorts of collections, particularly museums around the world, uh, but increasingly some other data sources, so point data. And uh, this is the map of the world according to GBIF, the millions of records in here. But you see it's geographically highly uh, biased. And we saw uh, a similar biased map earlier from, uh, from eBird, because where people or even birders are is uh, not necessarily always where actually biodiversity is, or it doesn't really cover the world uh, evenly. So we're getting a very geographically biased uh, data from that. And then here a little analysis that uh, uh, Carsten Meyer, who's here in the audience, and, and, and others and me have done that is digging a little deeper here and actually trying to do some, some more quantitative understanding of what sort of bias or, or type of knowledge we're actually talking about here with GBIF. GBIF is really like the global effort in pulling together uh, point data, distribution data. Um, as it's coming from museums mostly. And it's been going on for 10 years or longer. And this is what we have in GBIF currently. We have certainly millions of records, but as you see, the richness of species, according to these records here over a 100 kilometer raster, uh, is, uh, well, looks like this. And in many parts of the world, this looks like, uh, like a, a good coverage, but um, when you relate, relate, sorry, we are looking here at the richness. Up here is simply the number of, of uh, GBIF records, so the number of points. And you see these biases. And here's the richness map. And uh, um, yes, we, we get the great gradients that we see sort of uh, in some parts of the world, certainly more species here in southwestern Australia than inland, etc. But there is barely, barely any concordance with the expert knowledge about the species richness of those two groups. So, uh, the world, according to Chibif, uh, the richness of the world is, is, bears very little resemblance with the, the actual uh, species richness. Because for those two groups, we actually have expert maps that allow us to analyze this at 100 kilometers resolution. And, and I come back to that. So in this next analysis, we ask the question, how much would you have to sort of dumb down or coarsen our uh, Chibif point record to actually get to a full coverage? So to, to really capture all the species occurring in the region. And even as you go out to about 880 kilometers, in many parts of the world, we're still only capturing up to date about 30 to 50% of the species. So only here in, in, of course, North America and Europe and parts of Australia, uh, this point data gives us the, a, a proper impression of biodiversity of the species richness. Um, but it does only so at about uh, 800 kilometers or 900 kilometers. And that's not the grain at which you can understand biological mechanisms, and it's also not the grain at which you can do practical conservation. And it's important to realize that um, you can do some things with these point data, but there are limits to what you can do. So that many of you may have heard about this idea of environmental niche modeling, going back to Grinnell, who sort of introduced this about 100 years ago in, in California. Here, the California fresher, the species which he first applied that general idea that you can connect distribution points to 
quantify an environmental niche, sort of the multivariate space in which a species is sitting, sort of the climate, climatic niche. And now we, nowadays we can do that in a really uh, technically sophisticated way with all sorts of GIS layers, um, connect that up with this sort of point data we have, and uh, we can then quantify this niche, so sort of this climatic envelope in which a species is sitting. But a fact is that in many cases, and I'll show a few examples later, uh, the point data we have, so where people are running around or where people previously shot some specimen and put them in a museum is not necessarily where species actually occurs. So usually we have a very biased impression of the true distribution of a species. And in fact, um, the niche of the species may be looking like this. And that's really important when you try to then do climate change projections. And that's a, a very popular thing to do these days, sort of try to project the niche of a species into the future. Where may it be in the future, or what at least are the suitable areas in the future for a certain species. Um, if you get this, if you don't get this right, that sampling, if it's not representative, uh, you're also not getting that right. And that's a really sober lesson for uh, conservation science uh, in the face of climate change. Now, expert range maps are a totally different type of species distribution information. And for some groups of species, especially vertebrates, but increasingly also other groups, uh, butterflies, beetles, and so on, plant groups, we, we have pretty good expert knowledge. So uh, that's partly built on points, but actually mostly often on true expert field knowledge and understanding of species habitats that then looks like this. And uh, um, we've done some various analyses on that type of data too, and uh, I'll spare you the details here. I'm just going to show you one example that kind of tells the whole story. Uh, here's the Congo peacock. And this is still, at this point in time, our understanding of the global distribution of that species. This is the only peacock in Africa. It's kind of its own genus and own very separate group. It's not a small species, and it's really, really a special bird. That's human biodiversity knowledge about that species. And uh, when you then relate that to other types of data, you find out, well, it's roughly accurate at about 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer resolution. I mean, I spent a lot of time uh, trying to track down that species uh, right here in the middle, um, and uh, actually did, didn't find it uh, even in, in a month and a half. So it's even within those blobs, you have many holes where the species doesn't occur, and that's then translating into this idea of about a, accurate at about a 100 kilometer grain, right? You have a lot of false, oops, uh, false presences in this map, as we say. Now, contrast this with our knowledge of uh, the logging concessions in this region, right? Or what's happening in this part of the world uh, as soon as it will more and more stabilize. Um, we already pretty much have an idea of what places are going to go to plantations and so on. And we still don't quite know where this peacock occurs and, and which there are a few reserves in there also where exactly it is actually sitting and will be protected in the future. So I said about a 100 kilometer uh, accuracy in uh, expert maps. And uh, um, that's what uh, this era here is referring to. So though for vertebrates, for terrestrial vertebrates, we can bring it down to about here. Uh, for all vertebrates, we have ecoregional data that John talked about earlier. So on average, those places are 200 to 300 to 400 kilometers across. Um, that's our uh, knowledge for that. For some groups, we have 100 kilometer data. Uh, for some very few species, the global range would be covered through a, a standardized survey effort. That is whatever, 50 kilometer resolution or so on. But those would be species that are restricted to a corner of South Africa, a corner of Europe, or a corner of the United States. All other species would be sitting over here. Uh, and that's the number of species we're talking about. So there's a huge uh, knowledge gap. Now what Map of Life tries to do is to overcome that knowledge gap by integrating different types of distribution data. Now uh, regional checklists here, for example, that would be your ecoregional list. Um, so for every one of those 800 ecoregions in the world, there would be a species list. Uh, now, the grain of that sort of list is very coarse, um, but then it has barely any bias. So that's a good thing. That's global coverage. That's great. Covers every species in a certain group. Uh, but then you have a high false presence rate. So not within ev every corner of an ecoregion, you will actually find that species, right? So that's why we're overestimating the, the places where species that actually occur and that's why that data has such limitations. But if we bring this together with these point records, um, we may be able to overcome of some of that because their false positive rate is very low. On the other hand, they are biased, as I just pointed out, right? So those GBIF points are geographically very biased. 
Now, there are many other types of data um, that come in here, um, but uh, just, this just as an overview, and as part of uh, a larger group of people, and uh, in particular, uh, my co-PI, Rob Goralnik, who is in the audience also and will be speaking tomorrow, uh, we've pulled together this initiative of a map of life and infrastructure for integrating, advancing, and, and applying global species distribution knowledge. The idea is here to put together an online dynamic uh, workbench for documenting, annotating, integrating, validating, advancing, and ultimately analyzing the disparate sources of global biodiversity distribution knowledge. And this is how it's uh, uh, supposed to work, and this is how we've started it out. Um, there are these different types of data, and I'm just mentioning a few here in this example, and they come from a variety of different sources. And here's GBIF, of course, which is an important aggregator of point data, but so are many other places. There is tracking point data, there are many checklist compilations, uh, there are governmental and non-governmental organizations and museums pulling data sets together. And uh, um, if we were to mobilize that data, and much of it is already mobilized, but there is more to be done, um, and bring it together in one place on the web where we can display it, then at the very first step, at least, we can do editing and quality control. And quality control is a really important step here. We'll see that in just a moment. And we can crowd source, if you will, um, feedback. We can set up a spatially explicit wiki that helps with the quality control and provides feedback on some of this. And of course, the uh, point of incentivizing cam came up earlier. That's, of course, really important. Um, but by adding further down the road here additional services, we hope to really um, mob facilitate the mobilization. Now, um, I'll be giving you a little demonstration in just a moment, but uh, here are some of the initial ideas that are really, really important, some of which are already implemented, that, of course, we need to be able to filter data, flag data, um, should be able to upload own data sets. Uh, we are connecting with various um, uh, citizen science initiatives, such as eBird uh, and others, to allow the uh, direct, well, a direct connection or for other groups besides birds, ultimately the direct upload of, of uh, observations and particularly scientists' data sets. That's a really untapped resource that um, we want to mobilize here to really help fill some of the gaps that, of course, are uh, critical. And then offer various services down the road. So more generally, um, the idea here is that we address some of the key storage, metadata, query, user feedback, quality control, visualization, and modeling challenges that are kind of common to all spatial biodiversity projects. So that's really important to understand that, of course, uh, museums or small regional NGOs or people interested in a certain uh, group of species um, have sort of started to do some of this um, and throw data up in the web. But the problem with that is that there's, first of all, a lot of duplication of effort. And second, data often gets stuck in, in silos in sort of separate containers. And it doesn't come together to really facilitate uh, that integration and that cross-fostering that brings together that problematic blob map expert map with a problematic point data set to have those data sets cross-inform each other and put it out to the larger world to provide feedback and quality control. Now, let me now attempt something that's very risky, <laughs> and that is a, a live demo. Um, and uh, our lead programmer is somewhere in the audience. He may actually have run out just in case. <laughs> this is not working, but it looks good so far. Um, we are on the Map of Life website here, and just a quick search, for example, for a, a species called the hoopo, a really beautiful uh, bird uh, restricted to Europe. And this is, uh, um, first of all, just a demo website that I'm showing you right now. But uh, for birds and for certain parts of the world, we already have a, a pretty neat set of uh, data sets uh, ingested and in there or dynamically linked. And you see if we uh, query the species, we get a whole set of, we get like 15 or or 20 different data sources um, that are sitting uh, in different parts of the world, uh, and GBIF is one of them, but only one of them, um, that are coming together. We can click Map Selected Layers, and uh, you see here the world is, fill world is filling up. Um, note there's some hoopo in the ocean over here. Um, that's the sort of data that you sometimes get with the large aggregators such as, such as GBIF, um, where there are still problems with quality control, but bringing these different 
different types of data together, we are able to actually um, address some of that. So let me move this away. So here is the species. It's a, it's a migratory bird, um, but that also breeds, that breeds in Europe and Asia, but also in Africa. And uh, the points that you're seeing here, those are mostly points coming from Chibif. And uh, I could spend some time on this. I could click on these points, and you would get detailed information where they come from. I'm sure there are some eBird points in there too, actually. We would find that uh, they're sitting over on the computer in, in Cornell. Um, what you also see, though, is that the true distribution of a species and those blob maps here give you actually a good impression of the large extent of that species um, is only very, in a very limited way covered by point data. Of course, a lot of observations here in Europe uh, and a lot of observations here of very rare fall migrants that sort of make it into Scandinavia, uh, but actually not so representative for the species. Um, but uh, um, a lot of holes in it too. And you see two maps here, by the way. So one is a map from my own lab, and another one is the IUCN map. And they're kind of similar here, those blob maps. Um, let me just zoom in here to see, show you another detail. Um, going into this part of the world, you see these data sets pop up here. These are atlases, so survey, organized survey efforts that have been done in this region that also recorded for these pixels that species. And those are cells that are uh, 25 kilometer or 50 kilometer uh, in grain size. So for that part of the world, we actually have a much more detailed understanding of the species. Now, if you move up here to the higher latitudes, uh, we are lacking such, uh, at least here sort of in, in, in Asia, southern Asia, we are lacking that sort of survey data. Um, we are lacking points. Uh, now here in gray, you see the ecoregion map um, because uh, for, that's one large ecoregion here and the species is recorded for the ecoregion, but uh, that ecoregion data of clearly overestimates the, the, the distribution of that species. This is the expert range, so it reaches in here. Actually, I saw this species over here at some point. Um, and it is in some of those wetter areas, but it certainly isn't in those really dry parts. So that's where you see how um, some of the coarser data sets are clearly limited. Now, um, here's a, another example of a species, um, uh, the ground hornbill. And here, let me just point out another type of data. These are uh, local inventories. These are reserve uh, checklists where the species was recorded. Uh, and again, here, only from this region, atlas data and a few point data sets. But otherwise, um, with just point data, we would be completely misunderstanding that species. With ecoregion data, that gray par part here, we'd be overestimating the range of the species. And now, Next step would be to allow people to give feedback um, and allow range edits here, uh, and then a voting on that and a curatorial system that deals with that. Now, one final quick demonstration here. Um, we have a, a species list tool that if I click a button here, and actually we can go to here, and this is something that uh, eBird and also uh, a few other sites could do, I think, for birds in North America at least. This is uh, been done, we can click on a point in the world and get a species list back um, for birds in this case. Um, we can download that list, you can do other things, but let's go to a different part of the world. And that's really the important thing here that we're trying to do uh, a, an infrastructure that works globally and that really um, tries to overcome that, that uh, asymmetry that we usually see in our knowledge and also in educationally what's available uh, in the tropics compared to the high latitudes. So we can go to this part of Brazil, and you see that circle there. We're now querying the species occurring in that circle, so within 50 kilometers of that location. And uh, we get a list, and we can drill deeper here. Um, and for example, this is information that's coming from Wikipedia in the Encyclopedia of Life. We could click on uh, this page and uh, get taken to that species and learn more about it. So this is connecting back to uh, Eric Mata's talk earlier about Encyclopedia of Life. Um, we can look at the images of the species there, so you can actually uh, learn, get an impression of the diversity here, of the visual diversity, by looking at those images. You can learn about the threat status of the species, so which proportion of species is threatened or, or not, and you can download that list, that list. Let's go to a different part of the world, and uh, um, let's actually Go, to, go for a different group. Let's go for amphibians. Um, we can do this for amphibians, for um, North American fishes and reptile. 
and reptiles and for uh, mammals and birds. And here, uh, only 11 species of amphibians found here. Here are the images for them. Uh, there are several of them that are near threatened. And you can do that in any part of the world. And of course, there are many educational use cases here uh, and even scientific use cases if you want to find out what other species may occur around you. And then we are sort of hoping to develop over the next uh, half year an iPhone app, of course, that would allow you to, with the GPS location of your, of your phone, uh, get that list and the images and perhaps even a rough identification guide. And we're, we're talking with EOL to perhaps partner up on some of those ideas. Um, to, uh, uh, for, for the amphibians, the birds, or the mammals around you. And some of what I'll be talking about in the next five, eight minutes or so will be about how we can do better than that, how we can extend that to other species groups, how we can attach uh, a probabilistic estimate to this, and how we can we get it to finer grain size. The 50-kilometer radius is, of course, really large. You'll have many species in that list that won't be right around you. And with some modeling approaches, we'll would like to take it to a kilometer resolution um, with an uncertainty around that estimate. And that's what I like to focus on a little bit in the final parts of my talk. Um, just showed you uh, that species list tool. That's one of several tools we'd like to develop and launch over the next uh, year uh, or two years. Another application will be range refinement, an analysis of the predicted area network so immediately, if you have this species information, you can actually apply, you can use a reserve as a cookie cutter and get information about which species are actually in that reserve. Um, and you can, with that, understand quantitatively the coverage of the reserve network. Um, we can do biodiversity change protection and also change monitoring. And the whole idea here is that we're not doing a like one-off analysis. We're not writing one paper and then sort of leave it there. And because, as John earlier said, so, a couple of years and stuff is already outdated because there's better data coming available, there is new reserves arising, uh, or there is climate changing. So this needs to be dynamic. Here are the Turaco, Hartlab's Turaco, a very enigmatic group of species, by the way. I'm not going to go into that. This is our expert knowledge about the species. Um, so if you've seen some of those richness maps earlier, um, that's the sort of data those would be based on, right? And if you zoom in, this is... Uh, I mean, it's great we have that information, but it's not that detailed, right? This is for conservation. This is limited. It's a blob in East Africa. We can't conserve all of East Africa, clearly. Um, but we know more about that species. We know it's restricted to above 1,500 meters. And you'd be surprised about how many species we have that sort of knowledge, even for many butterflies, for frogs, for mammals. Uh, and it's data we can sort of pull in uh, down the road, especially through the web. Um, we also know it's a forest species, and that's something that's often very clear, something an open habitat or a forest species. So we can do better here. Thanks to the land cover information that I showed you earlier, we can identify at a one kilometer grain size, or even finer, which of the pixels would actually be suitable. Within that blob, within where we know that species is, uh, which pixels in one kilometer grain are actually suitable for that species? And it's actually only these, right? Suddenly we get a very different impression of of the distribution of that species. And we can look a little closer. And uh, so these are the forests around Kilimanjaro. Here's Mount Meru, um, etc. cetera. And uh, suddenly we're going from a global range of 230,000 square kilometers to just 23,000 kilometers, uh, less than 10%. And of course, we'd be, having, we'd be looking at a very different niche here compared to there, right, if we were to do global change modeling. <laughs> Let me skip that. Um, now, uh, we can take it a step further and now overlay that with, with the reserve network in the region. So these are not, I just made those reserves up, just, but just to show you uh, the general idea. And we can actually, uh, especially with more sophisticated modeling that I don't have the time to get into integrating these different data sources, we can get a probabilistic estimate. So how probable is it that a species would actually be within those reserve boundaries? And here, well, pretty likely. Here, not so likely. Up here, uh, pretty much no probability, right? So to assess uh, reserve effectiveness and coverage, we can't just overlay these blobs with our reserve network. We actually have to really try and get things to a much, much finer detail. We can do change projection and apply models as to how species and vegetation will move up in the future as the region warms. And you suddenly see that uh, the suitable area becomes even smaller and the range uh, will decrease dramatically. And we did an analysis globally, actually, where we did that for all montane bird species that exactly did that sort of thing for 1,000 bird species worldwide. And uh, 
It was a very quiet day, clearly, in the world, um, but somehow made it onto the front page here. And we, we find that a dramatic uh, loss of range size across all sorts of species worldwide in these high elevation habitats. And something we can do in a quantitative, very rigorous way, thanks to this detailed modeling. And we can combine that thing, of course, with the change projection uh, and the reserve analysis. Finally, we can do change monitoring, looking at, here we, for the Western Fence Lizard, an extremely rich record of point data. We can split that into um, phase period one, the 70s, and more recent period two, the 90s, and then look at how the niches and the ranges of a species like that have shifted between the periods. I'm going to spare you the details here, but essentially there are various scenarios. Uh, has this, the range shifted uh, or not? Has climate shifted or not? Um, and all sorts of different things may arise. And how does that all sit in relation to where the reserve is sitting, spatially and then environmentally? So to conclude, I hope I've laid out um, a somewhat at least con convincing vision that we really need to bring data together. We need to expose it. We need to do this in a dynamic setting online for others to interact. We need to incentivize this. We need to make visually interesting but also scientifically sound tools that people like to play with um, and that incentivize scientists to provide their data and collaborate. And then I think we can take a really large step over the next years to get an increasingly stronger spatial biodiversity knowledge that will be increasingly more useful for uh, quantitative conservation prioritization and also uh, for more rigorous uh, science. Let me just conclude that I think the greatest challenge in all of this is actually not technically realizing this vision. So we are able to do amazing things technically now. The big data uh, technologies that are coming online, the visual technologies that are coming online, that's not holding us back. I think what the real challenge here is that we need to overcome is to even just address this one area, just getting the spatial biodiversity science data right. Uh, the real challenge here is uh, sociological uh, rather than uh, technological. Thank you. Time for a couple of questions. So maybe this is relevant to your last point of the sociological challenges. Is how what, what kind of infrastructure are you guys developing in order to get more field data to, to fill in those gaps in the, the highly biodiverse tropical regions mm -hmm. where you're only relying on, on these expert data that are really based? Yeah. Now, especially in the tropics, um, contributions from scientists or or natural history travelers actually I think are absolutely uh, highly valuable. Yeah. And important. Uh, in fact, uh, we're trying to incentivize uh, some of such submissions, and I'm going to go into the detail how we want to uh, bring them into the system in a moment, but the one way to incentivize is actually to, to quantify how valuable such data actually is. So it's so much more valuable to contribute a data point uh, in central Brazil or, or central Indonesia than it is to contribute another uh, bird, uh, red cardinal data point for, the North, for North America. And there are actually quantitative ways in which you could perhaps um, set this up and, and then really um, uh, sh have people something they can talk about or measure. Hey, this is actually has this sort of value of, of, of contribution that I made here. Now, there are ongoing citizen science efforts, uh, some of which have been talked about earlier. Iber is a famous one for birds. And there's some other ones around the world for specific groups. And what we're trying to do right now is reach out. I mean. Uh, there are hundreds of such efforts, actually. Reach out and connect with them and see whether we can dynamically connect them in um, so that their data immediately flows into this larger system and can be used for, uh, for additional modeling. But we also want to facilitate the direct upload of data and uh, uh, make it as easy as possible for people to do and incentivize through those tools, through sort of value badges, as I just mentioned, um, and through uh, working with... Uh, specific communities, sort of nerd communities that are excited about their groups of species and then get into competition. I think there's a real opportunity here to get similar things going as eBird has um, for other taxa. It's not necessarily us doing that. That may not be map of life's job, but uh, at least we want to provide the infrastructure to make it easier for such groups to develop and, and pull together, if you will. Alison. I, I, I agree with you 
see that uh, there are really sort of uh, challenging to call them sociological issues here. As, as this information gets more granular and as it is uh, democratized, take for example elephants or tigers, uh, are you, I mean, it, it becomes a very easy way for poachers to find where the big herds are. And so, how, you know, I mean, it's not all good guys out there. So how do you, uh, how do you think about that? No, that's a very good point. Um, well, at this point, we're going at most to a kilometer grain size, and it will be probabilistic. Um, but uh, that may be enough for some species, of course, to sort of home in. And there, I mean, this is not just elephants, orchids, right, and egg hunters, um, um, other p parrots. Uh, um, so yes, and we've already got, I've already gotten some, you'd be, be surprised what sort of emails I've gotten of people like, oh, can we have this data? And then sort of you look closer and it's some commercial parrot operation. Um, and uh, um, yes, it is a problem, but it's something that can be addressed, right? So you can, certain species, you can have a list, a blacklist of species where you only offer certain more detail if, spe if people are accredited with a university or in some way. So I think there are ways to address that, but uh, it, it's going to take some work to be careful here. Yeah? So it somehow is fed back to people who are on the ground oh, yeah, yeah. protecting it. So how do yeah. you, I mean, is this map of life connected up in that practical yeah. way? Yeah. That's the hope and the plan. Now, we're working, I didn't have time to talk about this. We have this project in East Africa that, that we've chatted a little bit about, right? Where um, we're trying to get, take this to the region. So how does this sort of data compilation in practice work and benefit conservation again in a region as we go into more detail? Um, and there are great community-based conservation efforts in the region. Um, and the hope here is that we will we'll have this, 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 we have prosumers, people that are consuming some of this, um, understand better um, um, even sort of the distribution of certain predators uh, versus their livestock or, or whatnot, um, or changes that may happen under climate change. And with that, at the same time, incentivize folks to upload. And everybody in East Africa has a cell phone. That's why we need this sort of cell phone app that allows people to easily see, um, okay, what are the species around me? And I hope through actually mostly that educational aspect of that, that school children will be able to walk around with their $10 cell phone and get a species list on their cell phone of where they are, and that a, a, a school teacher is able to use that yeah, to do natural history education. Uh, I think that's just extremely empowering and it will really help um, educate the young people to then uh, address some of those, those issues that, that you mentioned. One more quick question. Uh, do you have time to go back to the slide that you missed? And, uh, it's a plant, Walter. No, no, I, I didn't, I didn't pay him. <laughs> <laughs> this one? <laughs> uh, the one about the hierarchical models uh -huh. you use. I, I was wondering if you could explain what... So uh, Petrus and Williams, the actually, he's our photographer in the back there. <laughs> he's been uh, developing this and we've been joining up trying to move this forward. So the general idea is, and I'll have to keep this very brief, is that we have some data that's accurate at coarse grains and others that's accurate at fine grains. And the uh, challenge is how do you bring those two different data, these different scales together, right? Uh, and then we have environmental data at the fine scales. And there are some really neat statistical approaches that are computationally very intense, but really promising that allow you to bring this data together, let the fine scale environmental data inform the coarse grain range data, and uh, as long as you have enough of that coarse grain data, you're actually able to get something out of it at, in the fine grain if you just take the right approaches. And what you get with, statistic, with Bayesian approaches is you're not only getting a median uh, predicted probability of a species occurring, so here for this free-toed woodpecker, uh, but you also get an, an uncertainty estimate around that probability, right? So with 2%, uh, so this is, uh, these are the areas where uh, definitely, definitely um, will we'll have uh, that species. Now, these are the areas where uh, we are less certain that the species is. And this is the median prediction. So there's a probability as well as uh, an uncertainty around that probability estimate. So a scientifically much more rigorous way of, of estimating species occurrence that's especially important as you try to overlay it with a reserve network to really then get to a statistically sound estimate with which probability is that species covered by this reserve? Um, and what is my um, confidence in that, in that knowledge, right? 
um, how ca certain can I really be that the species is, is predicted? Uh, so that's what this modeling approach is trying to do.